everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Byproduct Podcast. I am your host, Ian Pruckner, and I'm so excited to be with you here today, spending a few minutes together, getting better together, because when we get better, things get better. And I'm super excited to have a, a friend of mine and a 11-time author, 11-time author, absolute killer in the communication space, and just has this amazing energy about him. Simon T. Bailey, welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. Good to be with you. I love it. And so guys, listen, we're going to, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff, a really wide array of, of topics. You were saying we're going to talk about your new book, Resilience at Work, uh, which is absolutely a topic that I love. I think resilience is one of these ideas that, um, without it, you don't get very far, but it's also something that is not given out freely everywhere. Or there's not a lot of lessons in school about it. We're not taught this. We've, we've sort of got to go through the hard knocks of life for a lack of a better description, to experience our lack of resilience, most of us, and then to build that muscle up over time, which is incredibly painful, but incredibly purposeful. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about evolving from purpose-driven to presence-driven. We're going to talk about reinvention a lot. And so I'm super excited to be here. So, so let's just dive in right away to the new book, Resilience at Work. Why'd you write it? I wrote it because business and life is like surfing. Storms and winds will knock you off your surfboard, but it's resilience that allows you to pop back up on the surfboard, and it's your brilliance that allows you to catch the next wave. So you wow. got to pop back up. <laughs> yeah, and, and and that's life, right? Like I don't care who you are, how good you are at something. Sooner or later, you're going to get knocked off that surfboard in life, and it's what you do in those moments that determines the direction of the next step in your life, right? And so. In the book, it's it's written a little bit different than a normal sort of um, book that speaks to entrepreneurs and self development and all of that. In, in that, it's it's sort of this story and dialogue between these emotions or ideas, so to speak. Talk a little bit about that. Why did you choose to communicate this in that way? And and what was the brilliance, uh, for lack of a better term to describe that, um, behind? being able to communicate that message in that sort of unique way. So over the years, coaching and working with people all over the world, I discovered there are four personality archetypes plus one, and they're okay. called hurry, worry, ready, and steady. And they're curious. Okay. And they all meet at a surfing camp, sitting by a campfire at the end of each surfing lesson and hurry and worry wanted to understand what did ready and steady do to thrive. And so instead of telling them what they needed to do, they were invited, hurry and worry, were invited into a conversation to answer questions. Because Ian, here's the deal, you know your data better than anyone else. So for someone to tell you, you should do this, you should do that, and there are, there are times when that's totally appropriate. But when you're invited into answering questions, it really challenges you to dig deep. Yeah. Yeah, to come up with your own answers and to know why you believe what you believe and to sometimes second guess or triple guess your thought patterns and to make sure that you're right. I love that. Um, and one of the things that's really cool is instead of talking about it, they're showing them, right? They're engaging them in that process. And, and um, one of the favorite sayings that I have is that good advice from a bad perspective becomes bad advice, mm -hmm. right? And so... How do you get around that? You invite people into their own transformation, right? Which is really a very powerful way to do it. So, so resilience is something that is not needed until you have resistance of some sort. You don't need to be resilient when everything's easy and going your way and you have momentum. It's in the times that are opposite of that, when it's dark and you feel alone and you wonder if you can make it or if you're going to be able to take even one more step. I can remember feeling that way a lot early on in business. Like, I don't know where I'm going to get one more client. I don't know how I'm going to make even one more sale. I don't know where I'm going to get, but you have to find that place on the inside of you that says, I love my dream more than my current situation. And so I'm willing to dig into a deeper place and to become resilient and resourceful. How do those two words connect for you? What, what, what's the difference there between resilience and resourcefulness in your mind, Simon? So I think resilience is this ability to not just bounce back uh, better, but it's ensuring that you're not bitter. 
And the resourcefulness is what can I do instead of what I can't do. Here's what the research says. By the time a child is 17 years of age, they have heard no 150,000 times and only yes 5,000 times. Wow. So the resilience is finding the yes in a no world. Oh my gosh, I love that. Resilience is finding the yes in the no world. It's, it's a lot of times it's just persisting until. Yes. Until that next relationship, that next break, that next idea, that next shift in your life, right? And, and staying on that. And so many people take themselves out of the game just short of that next breakthrough, right? And yes. so that resilience factor to me is everything. I, I always tell the people that I, I have the privilege of coaching that as, as long as you stay, it's not if, it's when. As long as you stay, as long as you stay in the game, as long as you stay getting better, as long as you stay humble, as long as you stay coachable, it's not an if, it's a when things are going to work out. And that's such a, an, a message that is being underrepresented today. Like everything is, you know, how to, how to lose a hundred pounds and find the spouse of your life and be rich in the next 12 minutes by this course or whatever. And people have lost this grittiness and this ability to persist beyond the points that other people stop. Mm -hmm. And so I, I love this. Talk to me a little bit about the idea of brilliance. That's something you're relatively well known for in your space. And, um, and I love, I love the word and I love what it, what it stands for. What does it mean to you? Why did you write so in depth on that topic? You had a couple of books around that idea of brilliance. What does that mean? Brilliance? Is this a, a supernatural IQ? Is it, how, how do you, how do you, take that word and apply it to life. So brilliance is a system of well-being that unlocks your potential or net net, it's the genius of God in you. So when you tap into that genius, your it factor, that thing that separates you from everyone else, you get into your swim lane and you stop comparing yourself to everyone else because nobody can roll like you roll in your swim lane. That's for your confidences. That's where you practice mm -hmm. AI actual intelligence when you're in your swim lane. So yeah. that's brilliance. <laughs> oh, wow. So that is a really, really interesting thing because so many people are so busy trying to be somebody else right now, right? And it's like, there's a lot of injected values out mm -hmm. there in the world, especially in the social media world. You should want this. You should be like this. You should want this car, or this lifestyle, or this influence, or this way. And the problem is we're really, really bad at being copies of things we weren't supposed to be to begin with, right? And and I've watched a lot of people succeed at following other people's paths and and not succeed. They get one piece of what they're after, but they're empty and they and they feel unfulfilled and they feel like somewhat inauthentic, I think a lot of times because you know they followed a pathway that wasn't theirs. And an idea that I firmly believe in is that nobody compete can compete against you as you. You're the very best version of that that has ever been. Nobody will ever do it as good as you do it. And so finding that brilliance, that is a really powerful thing, but it's probably more difficult than people think in a world of conformity to stand out and to find that thing that you and you alone are good at your purpose, maybe let's call it and to dive into that and be so good at it that, that nobody in the world can do it. Like you, how does somebody find this? How, how do I find my brilliance? I mean, I don't, I feel like a normal guy. Where is that located? How do I get there? Number one, what's your universal assignment where there's a problem in the world that intersects with your talent, your gift, your skill, therein mm -hmm. lies your universal assignment. Number right. two, what would you do? if no one paid you to do it. So yes, money is important and you need money. But if it's always about money, you always show up with hat in hand and it becomes a transaction instead of a relationship. Yeah. So relationships are the currency of the future. What are the core relationships that are around you that are feeding into your brilliance by telling you you're solving a problem? And I think the third thing is in the world that we live in, how do you begin to understand that serving is the new selling? So how do I begin to serve wherever I am, giving a little something extra for nothing that people can't get wherever they go? So here's a prime example. Chewy.com, who has amazing customer experience, one of their pet owners, uh, their dog dies. 
Chewy.com finds out, says, listen, we'll cancel your pet food subscription. We'll refund your money. And the customer thinking that's the end of the transaction. The next day, the doorbell rings and there's a guy outside the door with a bouquet of flowers and a sympathy card from Chewy.com. That's serving, not selling. Yeah, oh, that's incredible. And let's touch on a couple of points here. What would you do if if money weren't an issue or you weren't getting paid to do it? And I love what you said, because money is important. And, and money is many ways sort of like a certificate of merit in terms of you know, how many people are you serving, right? Because in capitalism, unless you're stealing the money, people are giving it to you because they'd rather have you or your product or your service or your knowledge, or your time than the money. They're saying this would be a great trade. Um, but I love this idea that money should be a byproduct, not the product. The yes. product is people. The product is solutions. The product is service. The byproduct is money, right? And when you do one in abundance, you'll have the second one in abundance. But I love what you talk about with relationships, our currency. I don't believe that there has been a time in human history prior to like no real communication capability where relationships have been more important than they are now, especially with the advent of AI and technology. And so many of the things that are being done for us today, the things that, that AI cannot do is build a meaningful relationship with another human being, get to know other people and serve those people. And so I believe that like you, it sounds like the connectors of the next decade are going to be the people who have the most opportunity because they can lever the non-leverageable yes. from technology. It's um, also, uh, unfortunately, I'm going to admit probably one of my weakest areas, right? I'm, I'm just, I always tell people I'm a high A and I have like just this little team, the, the relational bone in my body is in my pinky toe, if if you can find it, right? It's just, it's always been work for me, but it's a work that's necessary to do because if we're not serving people at, at the end of the day, what are we doing? I think there's a convergence coming on. So, you know, talking about finding sort of that purpose, right? And, and where that intersection is, but you know, as we were talking before the show uh, a little bit about purpose, you said something really interesting. You said, I think we've got to evolve. We've all heard purpose driven life and great book. And it's good to know your purpose and have a purpose. But at some point we need to move beyond purpose. We've got to evolve from that to something new, to something next. What is that next? I think the next is being presence driven. And I say presence driven because this is from a place of failure. I had my daughter came into my home office one day. She said, Hey, dad, I say, Hey, baby girl. And I said, She wanted to talk, Ian, but I was emotionally unavailable. I get on a plane, come back home, and her mother says to me, You give everybody the best of you, but you give us the rest of you. And mm -hmm. I don't want the leftovers anymore. So what I realized, I was making money, but not meaning I was chasing after purpose, but did not have presence. And I built a house, but lost a home. And so presence driven is I show up flawed, perfectly imperfect to just say, how do I get a little bit better than the day before? And when you show up with that presence driven mindset in your personal and professional relationships, what people begin to understand, Ian, it's not about me. It's about we. How do yeah, we so, all together? So good. Simon, this is a lesson I'm learning today. <laughs> and it seems like there's no shortage of these lessons that life teaches. But, but one of the things that I write down every day when I write my goals, as it relates to my family specifically, but I try to live it in every area that I can, is that I'm present and in the moment. And how much of our lives, especially very driven people, like people who are listening to the show right now, they're big dreamers. They, they are uh, high achievers, they're action takers, they're people who make crap happen. That's what they do. And what I found personally was that sometimes you get so good at that and so good at making crap happen that you never stop thinking about the crap to make happen and you forget about why you're making it happen and who you're making it happen for. And that sometimes they would rather have you than the stuff you're making. And uh, so that's one of my goals every day that I, I just want to be present and things change when that changes, right? All, it's like, to me, it's sort of cliche, but it's like the world has sort of opened up in different colors to me that I see now because I just take a minute to connect with you. Like, where are you at? What do you need? What's going on with you? How can I help you? How can I serve you? And such a different thing that I'm going to do this and we're going to make this happen and this vision and that dream. And those are all great. But if you could put that together, you become 
very, very powerful. And that's what you're tapping into there a little bit with this idea. How does somebody get more presence driven? How do they, if they're struggling like me, they're, they're, uh, they're a doaholic, okay, instead of a peopleaholic. How, how do they make that transition? What are a couple of practical things they can do to move from purpose driven to presence driven? I want everybody to remember I M M intentional micro moments. Wherever you are, intentional micro moments, you're talking, a person sharing, hey, here's what I heard you say. Is is this what you meant? Did I did I really get that? What that intentional micro moment does, it creates a high quality connection. Another thing to realize is the difference between authentic listening and selective hearing. Sometimes we're just waiting for a person to stop just so that we can jump in. So when we practice authentic listening, it's that pause, three, two, one, and I'm zeroing into the moment. You know in that moment that you've been seen, valued, and understood. And I think the third thing is showing up in any conversation in person or virtually with this question, how can I best serve you? How can I best serve you? What you're saying in that moment, I'm not just showing up to take, but I realize that generous hands are blessed hands. How do I serve you? So good. I think the authentic listening part is something that a lot of people struggle with, especially a lot of leaders and communicators, right? We have an idea or some value we want to add to a situation or, or maybe some insight or a perspective. And it's like, oh, right. Like, let's get this out here. I want to, I want to contribute, but many times the biggest contribution we can make to somebody is seeing them in a world that is blind, right? In a world that doesn't care at all. And you're a number, you're a marketing technique, you're a, a, you're a pixel, you're a, you're a taxpayer, you're a whatever, right? And, but to see you for you and who you are and what makes you unique, I think makes you extremely unique. And the idea of micro moments is so interesting because you and I met at, at an event and we didn't talk for a long period of time, but but you were micro momenting me in some ways, right? Which I can see and because I felt a very good connection with you over a very short amount of time, right? Part of that might've been that we were doing a little bit of praise and worship next to each other, right? So you well, we get to know a guy a little quicker that way than, than like, you know, meeting for coffee and talking about your list of accomplishments. Okay. But, um, but, but you definitely uh, dialed in on that idea of that micro moment of just taking a second and really connecting with people and making people feel that connection back with you. Um, talk to somebody like me who is oblivious of micro moments and how do you, how do you recognize them? How do you take advantage of them? How do you implement them into practice? Yeah, I think for everyone listening to us, the next person that you are working with online with or just meeting casually, asking them about themselves. It's more powerful to be interested than interesting. We've heard that for years. So asking about them, then find something to compliment them. Tell them what they're doing right instead of what they're doing wrong. Taking that time to just invite people into being appreciated is profound. Here's what the research says. One minute spent on recognition creates 100 minutes of initiative all because you just figured out a way to appreciate that person. And then I think the third thing is always, always leave on a positive note. And that simply means the next time you're walking into a public place, hold the door for the person coming behind you. Let them go through. That might be the most kindest gesture that anyone has done for them. The next time you go to a restaurant, ask the server, hey, what other tables do you have? Bring me their bill. Don't tell them who paid it. And then you run out of the restaurant. Why? Because it doesn't matter that they say thank you. God knows that you did something special for them. Yeah. And that's a very empowering way to live when you're not. I love what you said there for a second, because recognition, one minute of recognition gets a hundred minutes of initiative, right? But then being able to, to give to others, but not require that for yourself is a dichotomy that is unique to very high level leaders, right? Where, where I'm going to understand about you, what you need, but I'm not going to come back to you to try to get that. I'm going to do it because I can and because I shouldn't, because it's the right thing. And that's, that's the standard that leaders hold themselves to. We're not, we're not doing this for the applause of other people. We're doing it because that's what we're supposed to be doing. That's part of our mandate on our life. It's so, so good, Simon. I love it. So circling back to the idea of resilience, 
Talk to me about a couple of times in your life where you've had to learn and live that resilience in, in real time. So after going through a divorce, being married for 25 years and getting hit with a half a million dollar bill that I had to eat and take care of, here I am trying to stay in business, right? Like what the heck? Two kids going to college. Uh, college, you know, is very expensive. Didn't want to contribute to the trillion dollar student loan debt. <laughs> and then also getting a cancer uh, diagnosis for prostate cancer. Thank goodness I am healed, totally whole. But walking through all of those things at the same time, wow. and even if the truth be told, having suicidal thoughts. Yes, I go to church. I love God. I've been in the church all my life. But it's real when you have mental health challenges. And you're like, you know what? I do have an insurance policy. If I just kind of check out right now, everybody would be okay, right? Wow. <laughs> so finding that resilience to say, you know what, God, I still love you. I still need you. It is not about me. Would you just help me get through this storm? What a humbling place. What, what place does humility have in resilience work? I would imagine quite a bit. You know what? So the way I would answer that is my mom told me the way up is down. The way up is down always being on our knees. My mom had the original degree in neology to begin to <laughs> kneel in his presence and say, I don't know what I don't know, but yet I still love you. I get goosebumps just saying that. Like, and, and, and when we say, I love you, Jesus, he says, I've always loved you. And to yeah. know that you're loved by God, oh my goodness, that's like a game changer right there. <laughs> wow, so good. And and to look at those trials that you, you go through and be able to be authentic in them and say, hey, look, these were real struggles and they were happening at the same time. And, and these struggles that I then dealt with as a, as a byproduct of that were even more real. But how you were able to be humble, you know, you see so many people and things happen and they say, why me? And it's a very me focused, right? And it's like, I'm trying to make sense of this. And I think resilience says, I don't necessarily need to make sense of this. I need to make the best of this, right? That's to me, that's what resilience looks like, right? And um, and it's so powerful that you come through that because here's what I, and I know a little bit about that, uh, about you because you shared that. Um, but I think most people meeting you would have no idea. You're so cheerful and exuberant. And you just have this joy about you. The joy of the Lord really is very evident in your life, Simon. And to see that you went through some of those extremely, extremely challenging things and dealt with really, really serious consequences of those things. And yet you kept that joy and you probably didn't have it all the time in, in that time, but you, you've come out. What, what can you say to the people right now that all hell is breaking loose in their life, like happened to you and they don't see a way and they don't think it's fair and they don't know what to do or where to go or how to solve their problem or what it's going to be like on, on the other side. Maybe they feel like, man, this is over. This is, this is going to cripple me moving forward. I don't know how I'm going to recover from this. What would you say from the pit of that moment yourself to the, to the version of you now on the other side? What would you say to that person if you had to go back that's in that moment right now? I would say how you start the day determines the day. So for me, for the last few years, every day I start in prayer in worship, going through the Bible app every day, seven days a week. I read Proverbs that corresponds to the day of the week every single day. And that habit, that little micro moment of spending for me the first couple of hours just in his presence calms me down. So all of the noise that happens throughout the day, I'm centered, I'm whole, I'm standing on the word because I did this when no one was looking. And yeah, that's, that's where the resilience muscle is developed when you're off the grid. Nobody yeah. sees you. That's so good. And, and I think you hit on a really important point right there. And that is the truth is greater than experience. When your experience was one in opposition to the truth that you know that all things work together for your good, right? Mm -hmm. Then you, lay, you lean on the truth, not on the experience. I think a lot of people try to try to substitute their experience for the truth. Well, if this is happening to me, then this just must be how it is, right? But that's not true. God has a different, a different outcome, a different ending to the story than the one that we see, or especially when we're in 
the dark chapters, right? We can become very fatalistic in the thinking of how it's going to end, but God has a thousand ways that we've never thought of. And he loves us so much, to, so much more than to keep us there. He's going to take us through that. Simon, um, I feel like I could sit and talk to you for another hour and we'd have all sorts of great fun together. Um, where does somebody connect with you? How, how does my audience find you, connect with you? Where do they get your books? How do they connect with you on social media? Where can they engage with you at a further level? Sure. Uh, they can go to simontbailey.com, T for terrific. And on social media, Simon T. Bailey, and they go to Amazon, Simon T. Bailey. So just use my name and you'll find me. Awesome. Fantastic. Guys, listen, go grab Resilience at Work. I promise you it's going to be a fantastic, fantastic read and a way to get get this idea, this concept that can be hard to learn, hard to understand. It's sort of ethereal out, out there and, and to practically apply it in your life to become somebody who doesn't just go through adversity, they grow through adversity and they become the people they're meant to be on the journey. And so, Simon, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your authenticity. Thank you for your joy. And thank you for walking in that presence, not just the purpose. It really has been a lot of a, a lot of fun. And uh, guys, until next time, we'll see you soon. Thanks for joining us. 